Welcome to these discussions around the idea of secular dharma. They've been motivated by our interest in and the participation on the two-year secular dharma course run by Stephen Batchelor through the Bodhi College. In this video, I forgot to switch on record, so missed the bit where Elfie began by talking about dharma for individuals being different from the concept of a collective dharma. The idea being that there is no one true dharma, but that not only is the dharma moulded by time and culture, but through the experience of different individuals. While there may be fundamental dharmic principles, they are manifested in different ways in each person. This is one of the reasons dharma associated with religion can be seen as flawed, as religion presupposes that all followers embody the dharma in the same way. This more flexible way of looking at the dharma also seems to align with the questioning approach to dharma that is fundamental to Zen Buddhism. Elfie then moved on to discuss how she first began to question this one-size-fits-all approach to the Dharma. In a way, for me, there's a circle closing. When right now I first got into mindfulness, I noticed this divide between the mindfulness stress reduction and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Because the stress reduction people were all Buddhists that taught it, like John Kabat-Zinn, mm -hmm. and they came with a fundamental thing, you just sit there, it will all happen. If you just sit there. So there is a, a, an absolute dislike and um, a kind of, um, what shall I say, it's not valued. The teaching is not even valued. That was my first impression of it, you know, that's just words. Who knows? So kick your reasoning out, indeed. That's just, if you just sit there for long enough, it will all happen. Um, and the, the cognitive therapy people, the Oxford people, that was taught by psych psychologists, and they were really into their cognitive understanding. They wanted to tease it apart. There's a lot of cognitive therapy in it. And they were all teaching oriented, but couldn't really say so because they had to great, they had to pay great homage to John Kabat-Zinn. And uh, so they also said, you just got to sit there, but secretly told you all about teaching cognitive science. And it's, it never sat easily together. And, and it still does, and you find it when we now walk out, you know, with our teaching attitude and our reason attitude, the clash is, is still immediately apparent. And, mm -hmm. and we might well meet those people who tell us we are wrong. You know? uh, when you were talking <laughs> just then, you were, you were summarizing, you were, had brought together the different aspects of what we been talking about about the um, the holistic nature of the philosophy of the Dharma and the different strands and how that could become built into something and at the same time the Dharma can have this individual aspect and this is this is the Dharma for me this is my Dharma that concept um, I haven't heard articulated before, I don't think. Um, you seem to have um, summarized what, what a lot of what we've been saying. I heard it for the first time too. You know how it goes with speaking. Right, okay. Because <laughs> when you were talking, Gary, there were, there were two other things which have been my sort of bugbears. And you were saying that, that over, you know, Two and a half thousand years, things have changed, and that there are other aspects which we need to consider. And I would certainly include science and creativity. Um, I mean, creativity in terms of individual creative acts, artistic acts, mm -hmm. um, which are not driven by uh, having to follow a dogma. Whereas most, uh, if there were creative things that were going on at that period, they were limited certainly in the artifacts that we've got any evidence of, to those things which were a requirements of uh, the hierarchies of the time, either the, the ruling elite or, mm -hmm. the, or religion. And we've got a different, very different outlook now on how to people can create things. So that and science, I think, are two things that we 
need to look at um, as aspects of how uh, the Dharma is, is different or how you cannot exclude those things from the Dharma. How they're integrated into it, I don't know, but they can't well, be excluded. Well, I, I've got this way of thinking about things. I mean, life is basically evolution. And, uh, and I think in, in terms, structurally, I think in terms of three types of evolution. You've got obviously biological evolution. You've got cultural evolution. You've got technological evolution. And all those things interact with, with, with one another. Um, you know, technological uh, um, um, innovation has affected our genetics by way, of, by the invention of fire, for example. With, with fire, we could cook. With, with, with cooked food, we could uh, absorb a, a good deal more calories. We didn't need to have a huge uh, digestive system anymore. Uh, so, you know, there's, the, these various strands of evolution can, can interact with one another. And humans are, are unique in having these other two strands, these uh, cultural and the technological um, uh, evolutions going along parallel with the, with the biological evolution. So I'm not sure where I'm going with that. But no, anyway. I, that, that, that. Well, that's that's. But that, I've been. I wrote it down and I'm recording it now, so I can. I, they're not. They won't go away. So that's, that's very useful. I think that's. I think you're entirely right. Mm. And um, anyway, <laughs> I didn't know what we we're going to talk about today, and I thought, oh, it doesn't really matter because this group is so fascinating. Oh, it's a wave goodbye. So because. It's going to go. Bye-bye. Okay.